we have a new president. We have a new emperor, or whatever it's called these days, right? And he was sworn in. And it's this fellow here. Let me show you. Give me a second here so I can put him on. Okay, give me a second. Here it goes. Listen to him, okay? President Xi Jinping taking the oath of office after becoming re-elected for an unprecedented third five-year term by a whopping, what? 3,000 to nothing vote. <laughs> Now, how's that for democracy, okay? 3,000 to nothing. You don't even get that in basketball or <laughs> any of those games. Um, yeah, so we have a new president, but what I liked about it, what I liked about the whole thing is this. And uh, here's a comparison between the United States and China, okay? In the United States, they swear on the Bible. And over there in China, I guess uh, they swear on the little red book. <laughs> they swear on the Constitution. You would think that's a little more advanced than this uh, old-fashioned uh, thing about swearing on the Bible. I mean, you know, uh, in fact, um, I'm sure a lot of Hindus and Jews and uh, Buddhists and so on, they may not appreciate, you know, someone swearing on the Bible. But uh, obviously this seems to be the choice of the one, the person who won the election, okay? You would think that maybe they would swear like uh, the Chinese are on the, you know, on the Constitution. I think that would be a much better idea. I mean, you could, for that matter, you can swear on your mother's grave. You know, you don't need the Bible. But I guess they all choose the Bible because of tradition. I don't know. Okay. Anyways, uh, here we have my my good old buddy uh, Frankie. Okay, and he says the following about the war in Ukraine, which is pertinent to what I'm going to be talking about today. And he says, Pope says Ukraine war fueled not just by Russian empire. He says the war in Ukraine is driven by the interests of several empires and not just of Russia's. Pope Francis said in an interview, right? Uh, Francis said that the conflict was fueled by imperial interest, not just of the Russian empire, but of empires from elsewhere. Okay? Without mentioning which ones, but we can all guess what he's talking about. And uh, that, that comes to what I've been saying, you know, that don't choose sides here. Uh, at least that's what I learned in my life. Don't choose sides in politics, okay? Don't, don't go with Democrats, don't go with Republicans. Don't go drink beer that day, uh, voting day, right? Uh, why? Because, you know, you might say, well, I'm an American and I love my flag, I love my country, I sing the national anthem, and that's about all you get. <laughs> that's, the, that's the only benefit you get. You don't get to decide you know, whether weapons will be sent to Ukraine, whether you uh, sabotage uh, China, you don't get to decide any of that. All you get to decide is look up the flag, say the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, sing the national anthem, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, that's about as far as nationalism buys you. You know, nationalism and five cents doesn't buy you a cup of coffee, okay? That's my five cents worth on it. Now, the question is, why would the United States go goad uh, Russia into attacking Ukraine, okay, because, you know, if you, you want to be honest, there was a goading on the part of the United States, like, you know, here's the chip on my shoulder, I want you to knock it off, and, you know, Putin came in there and knocked it off. That's essentially what happened here. It's, it's two thugs, you know, fighting against each other, United States Empire against the Russian Empire, that's all there is here. And so why did they do that? Well, I'm saying that the United States more or less had no choice. Neither one had choice. You know, it's like a chess game. You, you play a chess game, this guy moves a rook, and he forces you to make a certain type of move, like you know, assuming you're playing blacks in this case, right? Uh, you're, you're, you're forced to move in some way or the other because of the way the other guy moved. Okay? It's kind of like that. Okay? And, um, and yeah, uh, the United States goaded Russia into attacking Ukraine. Russia's now uh, in this quagmire where losing people and weapons and, and bullets and cannonballs, whatever, right? And uh, the United States is also, you know, feeding a lot of its uh, production, 
military production to Ukraine to, uh, you know, kind of even up the score and have them kill each other over there, you know? Why would the United States do something like that? What is the benefit? Is it for democracy? No, absolutely not. It has nothing to do with the word democracy. It's got to do with the United States uh, not being to expand its empire. That's what it's got to do on the side of the United States. On the Russian side, there's other reasons. But on this side, you know, on the American side, it's that the United States was forced to do this, okay? Because it cannot expand its empire unless it brings Europe under its wing. Okay, that's my five cents worth on that. And what's the worry? Well, the worry is China. Because China's growing uh, economically and militarily, okay? And it's it may... Not that it will, but it may surpass the United States. It's, at least it's approaching, it's uh, encroaching on the power of the United States. And the United States is not growing as fast as China is. And it worries them that if you project that into a few more years, you know, they'll be at the same level. Okay, that's more or less what the situation is. The United States had to do something about that. This war came in handy. Okay? They said, we'll, we'll just encroach on Russia and we'll see what happens. We'll push, 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 push until something happens. Something did happen. And what, what happened was the United States swallowed Europe. That's what happened. <laughs> and that's what I'm going to look at in a few minutes here. But the issue, that's the context. Okay? That's the way I look at it. Okay, so um, uh, here we have uh, an introduction to that. It comes from Miss, Mrs. Yellen. You know, and she said the following puts it in the right context. Okay, she says, Washington, you know, uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen uh, told uh, the House there, right, to raise the federal debt ceiling without conditions, warning that a default on U.S. debt would cause economic and financial collapse. Now, keep in mind, the United States is the number one country in the world in power and e economic as well as military power, right? And what would happen if the United States financial system were to collapse? Well, that would not only affect the United States, it would affect every other country in the world that depends on the United States for many things, okay? So that's the main issue. And Young said that the failure to increase the 31 trillion, 31 trillion borrowing cap would threaten the economic progress that the U.S. has made since the COVID pandemic. Uh, the only option to avoid a crushing spike in interest rates following a default is for the U.S. to commit to pay its bills on time, right? Because if the United States defaults, well, guess, uh, guess what that does to the world markets, right? Could be a disaster from which no one recovers, maybe beyond depression, okay? If we don't do that and think that there's some shortcut around it that will avoid economic chaos, we're kidding ourselves because not paying the government's bills will produce economic and financial collapse. Absolutely. Uh, I, I agree with her, you know. Now, uh, you know, both parties play politics in these instances. And uh, so they say, well, uh, and, and they want to be bribed. In other words, they say, well, if you pass my project, then I'll vote for it, you know, that sort of thing. So it's like they put conditions and she said, look, this should be unconditional. You know, it should be unconditional. You should not uh, play around with the uh, debt ceiling because if we need it, we have to create more money. And if not, we might have a collapse. Not only U.S. collapse, you're talking about a global collapse here, okay? The, whole, the entire U.S. empire. But uh, that means that all they're doing now is, you know, curing this with monetary policy. They're saying, let's just create money. What is that? That's inflation. <laughs> In other words, they can't avoid just putting more money into the system. And the question for you or the one that you should be pondering is whether they can do this eternally. Can we create, can the government, the U.S. government create more dollars, you know, put more money into circulation forever? You know, where's this getting this money? Is this real money or is this uh, just, uh, you know, devaluating the uh, uh, acquisition power of, uh, of the proletariat? That's the issue, okay? You're, you're reducing people's salaries when you create money immediately okay so keep all that in mind anyways uh she's right here's the chart okay u.s debt rises irrespective of who's in the white house you know you see the red and blues okay and it's been rising at least for the last 40 years and all they're doing is just creating more money okay so that means that the dollar today uh, has no relation to the dollar of 40 years ago and the question is can they do this eternally 
And you would think, I don't know, you look at that curve, it would seem like it's growing exponentially. That means the next guy who uh, gets the White House in Congress, right? Uh, I guess they'll go into the 40 trillion and so on. I think it's just going to continue to grow. And the question is, when you do that, uh, you know, you're creating money out of nothing. I mean, you know, is the United States producing this uh, uh, from its workers? Or is this real? You know, and obviously, if you can just put another zero on the debt at the end, you know, three billion, three trillion, let's put 30 trillion. You know, if you can just put another zero in there, I mean, what are you doing? <laughs> Think about that. Okay? All you're doing is re reducing uh, the uh, acquisitive power of, uh, of consumers, the workers. Okay? So I don't know if you can do that eternally. Okay, so here's a, a little breakdown on some of the highlights, uh, milestones, and I haven't covered them all here, but just to give you some things that are happening or that have been happening in the last two years, okay, that puts the, the world situation in the proper perspective, at least from the United States point of view, and perhaps also the Europeans, I would say here, okay? Here it has it. It says uh, September uh, 2021, right? U.S. Uh, persuades Australia to cancel a 40 billion submarine deal with France and instead buy nuclear subs from the U.S. You know, the French didn't like that at all. And here, here, here's one article that talks about that. It says Australia made huge mistake by canceling submarine deal, French ambassador says. And it says the move caused fury in France, a stab in the back. And uh, Malaysia fellow says, uh, could trigger a regional nuclear arms race. I mean, they're, they're abandoning the uh, old fashioned subs and they're going into nuclear. That means the Chinese are probably gonna produce more nuclear subs in the area. So it's just gonna be, you know, more subs and subs and subs in there, in that region. Okay? And so the question is, is this good for anybody? I mean, from one point of view, it's not good for uh, military reasons because all you're doing is creating the environment like, like what happened before World War I and World War II. You know, these wars don't start from one day to the next. There's preparations going on in times of peace, you know, if you could call that peace. Uh, there's preparation. People are militarizing in quiet, in silence, right? And then one day something explodes and says, well, we got the weapons, so let's go to war. And that's how it works. So are we uh, in the calm before the storm? You know? Okay, then what happened next? Well, in February of, uh, of uh, 2022, Biden tells the world that the U.S. will bring an end to Nord Stream 2 if Russia invades Ukraine. Okay, and this is, here you'll see good old Biden say this. Okay, give me a second here. Listen to him. If, uh, if Russia invades, uh, that means tanks or troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine uh, again, then uh, there, will be, uh, we, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. What do, what, how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will... Uh, I promise you we'll be able to do it. Okay, so he promised to shut down Nord Stream 2 no matter what. Sure, uh, that same month we have the Ukraine war. And guess what happened? Uh, well, later on we'll see, uh, yeah, Nord Stream 2 was indeed <laughs> blown up. Now, uh, you remember how these things work. Uh, the other side said, oh, he said that? We'll blow it up and blame him. You know, that, that happens as well. So we don't know who really blew it up. Someone knows out there, but we don't. Okay, and uh, Russia's denied the uh, right to investigate the issue. I'm not even sure if that would help in any way. Okay, but the point is, um, the prediction came true. And we're going to be talking about predictions today. Anyways, uh, anyways, then in July, just a couple months later, U.S. persuades Germany to cut oil deals with Russia. Not only oil, but also um, uh, coal. And here's the, an article talking about that. Germany to stop buying Russian coal on August 1, oil on December 31st. Okay, So um, Germans don't want to buy any more oil from the Russians or coal. And that was because the United States put a gun to the Germans' head, right? 
And so it's like, you know, you're part of the empire. You, you got to fall in line, you know, buddy. And, you know, even though the oil and the coal was relatively cheap for Germany, now it's got to pay a lot more. And it depends on the U.S. to feed <laughs> oil, at least oil. I don't know about coal. I don't think so. But uh, Germany re reopened some of its mines, coal mines. It's got mines here, right? And so, uh, you know, just how things change because of this globalization, this uh, global thing that we have, uh, the geopolitical uh, scenario, right? Okay, and then um, in August of 22, U.S. passes the 280 billion chip law to subsidize chip manufacturing in U.S. I thought uh, the U.S. was a capitalist country, and now it turns out that it's a communist country. It subsidizes uh it's so-called free market system <laughs> right it's subsidizing and i guess other countries force it to subsidize because they're subsidizing their industries so china, if china subsidizes its industries uh free market it does not exist you know companies over here cannot compete so they could go to the government and say oh please subsidize us as well <clears throat> and the government has no choice but to subsidize or put um in place some tariffs or whatever right <clears throat> to prevent the other side from gaining any advantage so it's like China's forcing the United States to be communist and not the other way around, right? And yeah, here's the article, the CHIP Act, okay? And uh, you'll see it on the, the White House um, website, okay? Science Act will lower costs, create jobs, strengthen supply chains, and counter China. That, that's the big deal, okay? So yeah, they're a little worried about China getting close to the power, the might of the U.S. government. That's a big danger right now for the U.S. government. Here it's not growing as fast and it has this advantage in technology, which it may be eroding, especially when China has so much manufacturing over there. That's what's concerned here. And they had to, as far as I'm concerned, that's what they had, the big picture, is that they had to create an incident. Uh, and that was Ukraine goading uh, Russia to invade Ukraine. Why? Because they care about Ukraine and Ukrainians. Why would they care about Ukrainians? They're Russians. There's no difference between Ukrainians and Russians. They eat the same nonsense. Uh, they they have uh, the same language. They're the same. They have the same religion. Also, it's it's all the same. Uh, but the issue was not to get uh, Ukraine into NATO because you know even if it's it's an addition, it's not an important addition. It was to get control over Europe. First, they took England, UK out of there with this Brexit. And now they're taking the rest of Europe. And as you can see, they're, they're destroying some of the big industries like subs, right? Chips, okay? they're, they, they want to have control over that. Um, and they're also telling the Europeans, especially the Germans, to cut ties with China, economic ties. You know, so that's another thing that's going on. Okay, it turns out they did blow up Nord Stream 2, and here's a... Uh, you probably saw the article somewhere. Okay, here it is. That's where they blew it up. Okay, Nord Stream uh, 1 and 2 pipelines there. Okay, so they blew that up. Someone did. Okay, we don't know who. Can't blame anyone because we don't know and we don't even know those people who are investigating if uh, they're investigating or uh, eliminating evidence. You know, they, they can say whatever they want now. Okay, uh, then it turns out the EU also. Uh, pass a, a, a CHIP Act of its own. This comes out of the European Parliament. Okay, CHIPS Act, a EU, the EU's plan to overcome semiconductor shortage. And it goes on to say, in a world facing a crisis due to the lack of semiconductors, the European CHIPS Act aims to secure the EU's supply by boosting domestic production. And uh, it might be a little misleading because uh, some of those companies, you know, are American, like AMD's there and Intel's there. Okay, so keep that in mind. So when they say they boost production, the question is whether that helps the Europeans or the uh, American companies. Okay, so that's also in the background. And um, then the U.S. persuades recently, more recently, U.S. persuades persuades Netherlands, right, to stop selling semiconductor processing machines to China, sophisticated like. Uh, aligners. Uh, aligners are very sophisticated. They're machines that are in the photolithographic uh, area of the fab. Very delicate process. You put photoresist on a wafer, take a picture of it with some very sophisticated machines. They're able to uh, 
carve into the photoresist these patterns and those are eventually what's going to be etched and doped and so on and make the device work okay and so in netherlands uh there's a company there and here it is asml and they're a big uh, important company the u.s imposed semiconductor export controls on china now a key eu nation is set to follow suit and that's uh the dutch government is analyzing what law to implement so that asml does not sell some of its top machines to china uh, so who does asml sell those machines to then in the alternative and i wouldn't uh, put it past the united states buying out asml in in the near future and again, uh, the United States is putting restrictions all over Europe right now. If that ain't conquering a, a region, well, I don't know what is. <laughs> okay, so keep that in mind. And then the last one here, and again, it's not limited to these. There's other things going on, right? Uh, among them that they took uh, Russia out of the SWIFT system, which was how they passed uh, money between Russia and Europe. That's gone, right? Uh, and it says, the latest uh, news says that U.S. subsidizes Volkswagen, okay, battery production in U.S. against EU protests. And this is it. Um, what Biden is trying to do is, uh, according to his way of thinking, right, is to bring manufacturing back to the U.S., okay. And here it is. Biden did it. Uh, electric, um, electric vehicles, battery manufacturing is coming to America. So President Joe Biden's policies appear to be having their desired effect. It should mean more jobs and cheaper electric vehicles for Americans in the long run. Volkswagen, uh, Europe's biggest car maker, is holding off on plans to build a battery factory in Eastern Europe as it avoids Europe's response to the incentives Biden is offering in, com uh, in companies making batteries in America. Okay, So the company may decide right, to prioritize a factory in North America where it could benefit from $10 billion in subsidies. Now that's, uh, that's a, a big bribe there, right? Okay, The European Union is considering offering other incentives to keep production on the continent. So now the United States is encroaching on European economics uh, through these moves, and the Europeans are not too happy. You know, all these things are happening there. And they're not too happy about some of them, but it's like, you know, you're, are you on our side? Like uh, George Bush said, well, you're either with us or you're against us. <laughs> so uh, you got to be with the with the empire, you know. It reminds me of the Delian League in the days of Athens, where, um, where first uh, uh, the Athenians said, hey, let's all get together, all their friends, right? All the city-states that were friends of Athens. And they formed this Delian League, okay? And so, okay, they had the Delian League. And it turns out over time it evolved and Athens told uh, the city states, look, uh, don't worry about sending ships and men down here, uh, just send money and we'll use our own men and ships and army, etc. And so it turns out that uh, if a city state rebelled and said, well, we don't want to just send money, what do you think we are, uh, paying tribute to Athens? And Athens then would send the army against the, these, these tinier city-states and say, look, you better pay up. Tony wants his money. <laughs> so if you didn't want to get into trouble, you had to bow down and send tribute to Athens, and Athens built its empire. So the, the Delian League was a way of building Athenian empire. Okay, then he got into trouble with Sparta, but that's a separate story. Okay, so uh, what's the issue? The issue is the United States is a little worried because of some of the uh, facts, the realities. Okay, here's one reality, and that's population. Okay, this is China, U.S., and Russia, just to give a comparison in population. USA has three times, two and a half, three times the population of Russia. China has four times the population of the U.S. There's four Chinese for every one American. Okay. And it's like a little over 10 times the size of Russia. So that's one issue. You know, here they have a lot of manpower, something that the Russians don't have right now uh, to fight in the war in, uh, over there in Ukraine, right? So they're suffering with that. But, uh, you know, if uh, you, the USA has to rely on covering the map, you know, especially in the, in the Pacific over there in, in the region of China, the, the Chinese are going to make the United States suffer with just the amount of the volume of weapons, you know, submarine ships, etc., that they put on the ocean. Right now, I found out the other day, Chinese is the biggest um, 
navy in the world. I thought it was the used to be the British, right? Then I thought it was the Americans, but no, the Chinese are now the uh, the country with the most ships, and it's not going to stop. I mean, for a country as big as China is, and with the extra cash that they have on hand, you can see why the United States is a little worried about you know its colonies out there, and so it's trying to create this. Uh, Delian League over there with Philippines and Thailand and Indonesia and whoever it can get in Australia, right, and Japan, and to see if it can uh, have some friends there in case there is a war against China, specifically over Taiwan, right? And that's one issue. Here's another issue. It's the growth rate. You can see what's happened uh, at least since 1960. The green one is China. And China went up and down, was very low in the 60s. It just had come out of uh, it's uh, World War II fighting with Japan, so it had a very lousy economy. It was uh, in deep uh, caca, right? But quickly it gained um, it gained um, growth. But you can see uh, that overall it's been in the tens and fifteens uh, for quite a bit of time, even up to today in the early two thousands, right? But since then. China is dropping a little bit and it's dropped to 5 and 6%. Meanwhile, the United States, at least uh, since the 60s, has not done much better than 2 to 3% in general. You know, a little bit higher sometimes, maybe around 5%, but that's about the highest it's, it's gotten in the last, uh, I don't know, 60, 70 years. And, and um, you know, if China keeps growing at 5 to 6% and U.S. only at 2 to 3%, well, you can see that there's going to be a problem for the United States. And uh, I, I just drew these lines, these are mine, right, so that you can see what's happening overall. Both China and the U.S. Uh, are coming down. They, they can't grow at 5 and 10% forever. In fact, the reason China grew so fast, it was so backward that it had no choice but to come into the modern world. But now it's almost there. And if we have it right, uh, the Chinese uh, intend or plan or project to have a what they call modern army or modern uh, defense etc uh, in about four years by the year 27 so they're working very hard on weapons you know uh, they're not asleep and the United States knows that and it's got to look ahead and find out what it's going to do in four years okay if there's no war between them there's no incident right uh, here's the buildup of China and you can't just sleep and let them do it. Uh, you kind of have to, you know, see what you're going to do. And that's what all the military in the U.S. are thinking about, you know. So everybody's moving their uh, pieces on the chessboard. And we'll see what, what happens. But almost sure, I could almost bet that there's going to be an incident. There's always an incident because it's to someone's convenience. Okay, so there will be an incident. That's, that's my five cents worth. Uh, I'm predicting. <laughs> predicting here, I'll put my... Uh, uh, astrologer cap on, I'm predicting there's going to be an incident. You know, one of those, uh, how do you call it, false flags? <laughs> and uh, so get ready for that. Anyways, here's the uh, GDP share, uh, global share of GDP. And you can see that what is projected is for China to surpass the United States. So it's not going to surpass the United States, if this is true, right? It will surpass the United States in influence in countries of the world. Uh, maybe it gets to even put the renminbi, the, the Chinese uh, money, instead of the dollar or push the dollar aside a little bit, right? Or maybe a lot, who knows? But this is the projection. This is what the United States fears, exactly these trends. All these trends are something they watch and they say, look, this is not very good at all for us, okay? That's why China's in the news lately, and that's why the United States, that not Russia, which got all these ICBMs, not Russia, but China is the enemy. The, big, the enemy to watch out for, okay? Okay, so uh, again, here's the uh, GDP since 1930s. Uh, you had that era of depression, then you have the Roosevelt uh, New Deal, and then you had the war, and you can see how things got really good during the war, you know? Uh, we don't care about how many people died or who died, we care about the fact that, you know, the uh, country was growing, <laughs> manufacturing was booming. But then after the war, you can see how it's a stead there's a steady decline in the uh, percentage, right? Uh, so, you know, keep this in mind. This is something that uh, cannot be avoided. It's going to happen to all countries. Right now, one country that's uh, booming a little bit is India. 
and it's it's booming because it's so backward and so do not be mistaken you know maybe it's the next china in the sense that it's going to be booming in the next couple years three four years maybe but you know with technology they can do that very quickly and once they're up there then they get into asymptotic growth when you get into asymptotic growth you know you're in trouble that means it's the end of the cycle if you made the most of it while they were growing great for you you know as an individual but then after that you know uh you get into this asymptotic growth and everybody's going to get into that asymptotic growth meaning the whole planet the the economy of man okay goes into asymptotic growth and the question is what happens after that well bill gatey will tell you that extinction happens after that